Hey everyone, hope you're well. We are letting uh, folks into the room right now. My name is Josh Haskell. I'm a general assignment reporter with ABC7 Eyewitness News in Los Angeles. And uh, feel definitely grateful to be a part of this important conversation as so much of our coverage is new issues, problems facing the youth, the, the future. And this is definitely something that the American Lung Association has been working really hard to get out in front of. Uh, and so it's a conversation that I feel uh, thankful to be a part of. And we have a really impressive group of panelists today. And uh, it's a story that I've covered extensively. And to find out more information about me, you can always visit any of my social media handles, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, ABC7 Josh Haskell. So again, I'm Josh Haskell, ABC7 Eyewitness News. I think we are ready to get started. I know we're just letting a few people in right now. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and I will just wait for the sign to uh, get things underway. Just give us one minute as we let a few more participants in the room. All right, let's get started. So first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the Lung Health Speaker Series, LA Community Connections, Youth Anti-Vaping. Uh, we have Dr. Cardo Hano here, Assistant Professor, University of Rochester Medical Center. We have April Forrest, Master's um, Public Health, Health Educator, Pasadena City College and Adjunct Professor at Occidental. And we have Kimberly Luna, uh, CHES Health Promotion Specialist with the American Lung Association. So those are three very impressive panelists. Uh, why are we here? So it's 2022, and about one in 10, more than two and a half million U.S. middle and high school students currently use e-cigarettes. Now, uh, that, that's from the past 30 days. 14.1%, that's 2.14 million of high school students, and 3.3% medical students reported current e-cigarette use. Overwhelmingly current users used flavored e-cigarettes with food flavors being the most popular followed by candy desserts and other sweets. We know that vaping is bad for heart and lungs. Nicotine is the primary agent and is highly addictive raising blood pressure and spiking adrenaline which increases heart rate and the likelihood of having a heart attack. So this is something that the American Lung Association is dedicated about getting out in front of and making sure that we don't have our uh, newest generation uh, of youth, middle high schoolers that become addicted to nicotine because uh, we've already been through that. Um, so the American Lung Association, as I just said, they're concerned about losing another generation. Uh, so that's why we're here right now. First of all, I just want to start with our first panelist, Kimberly Luna, um, and uh, I'll read a short bio. Um, Kimberly Luna is a health promotions specialist with the American Lung Association. She graduated from Cal State University Northridge with a bachelor's degree in public health and a certified health education specialist. Um, Kim's passionate about creating a healthier environment for our future. She's worked with high school students to educate decision makers on issues related to youth vaping, and has organized campaigns throughout LA. All right, uh, take it away. Kimberly Luna. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Josh. As Josh mentioned, I'm from the American Lung Association, and we are a nonprofit that's been around for more than 115 years. And our mission is to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease. We do this through advocacy, research, and education. Next slide. And I know we're talking about vaping, but I always like to start by reminding us about the tobacco use in the United States. It's still the leading cause of preventable death and nearly half a million Americans die prematurely every year. And even though we are the Lung Association, so we focus on lung health, smoking affects every organ in your body. So that's what makes it really harmful and deadly. Next slide. 
But I wanted to start with some uh, common vaping misconceptions that we see a lot. One thing that people think is that vaping is less harmful or less addictive than traditional cigarettes. But that really comes from the fact that with cigarettes, we have decades of research showing that cigarettes are deadly. They're very harmful, not only to the user, but to people around the smoker. Um, and we just don't have that kind of research yet with vaping. But we know a lot about the different components of vaping. We know that it has nicotine, which is harmful to uh, developing brains. We know that it has heavy metals. A lot of the flavorings, the chemicals that create the flavor are harmful. So even though we don't have the same type of research, um, that's coming. And we do know that it is harmful. And a lot of the vaping products have a uh, more higher concentration of nicotine. So potentially they're even more addictive than cigarettes. And so you give nicotine, almost all vaping devices contain nicotine. A lot of times people think it's just flavor or it's just something, you know, that helps you pass time, but it's actually very addictive. And the last one is something that I see a lot personally, which is that the secondhand smoke, which is actually aerosol, is harmful. And I notice this because a lot of times people will vape right in front of me or they'll vape inside. And, you know, the aerosol that comes out smells good and it disappears right away. So because of that, I think a lot of people think that they don't need to go away from the crowd like people who smoke cigarettes will do. Um, but we know that that aerosol that comes out of the vape actually contains nicotine. It contains ultrafine particles that can go deep in your lungs. It contains cancer causing chemicals. So just like secondhand smoke, that's how we need to treat the aerosol coming from vapes. Next slide. Another big difference between, or one big difference between vaping and cigarettes is the amount of flavors. You've probably noticed that there's thousands and thousands of flavored vape products. And this is obviously bad because it appeals to children. And you can see some of the examples in the picture here. Some of these products look like Pop Rocks or Swedish Fish. So this, even though they say it's an adult product, we can see that it's marketed towards children. And it's not only bad because of that, but it also masks the harshness that you would experience when you first start smoking. And this is true even with menthol cigarettes. So because it masks the harshness of first starting, it makes it easier to, for children to start smoking and it makes it easier for them to continue to smoke. And because of this, we know that 80% of young people who have ever used a tobacco product started with flavored tobacco. Next slide. And so um, to combat this, Congress actually banned flavored cigarettes back in 2009 because we know they are starter products for young people. However, they left out menthol and e-liquids. So that's why even though we know that this is an issue, vape products were able to become so popular. And we know that one of the main reasons that teens use um, e-cigarettes is because of their appealing flavors, which you can see the picture here. They do look very appealing. Next slide. So one way that we combat this is with tobacco policy. And two of the goals of tobacco policy are to reduce youth access and stigmatize tobacco use. And both of these things have been successful with traditional cigarettes and getting the teen smoking rates down to historic lows before vaping came along. So stigmatizing tobacco use, uh, we saw this work really well with traditional cigarettes. They used to be everywhere, like in restaurants and airplanes. They were in commercials and just looked very glamorous but we did a good job of making them seem undesirable. So now people will not want people smoking around them. So we're hoping to do the same thing with vape products. And then another thing, reducing youth access, the way that we can do this is with flavor restrictions, which you may have heard of, minimum pack sizes, 
which makes the products more expensive, and increasing the age to 21, which hopefully helps get the products out of the hands of high school students who might be 18 still. Next slide. So based on these goals of our tobacco policy, what's been done already, on the federal level in April of last year, the FDA announced the intent to ban menthol cigarettes. So that's something that's in the works. And you probably heard on the state level just this month, Prop 31 passed, which banned flavored tobacco products throughout California. And then locally, we've done a lot of work as well. In October of 2019, the Board of Supervisors voted to ban the sale of flavored tobacco products in unincorporated LA County. They also set the minimum pack sizes prohibited sales in pharmacies. And this has been done not just in LA, um, unincorporated LA County, but also in several other jurisdictions throughout LA. Next slide. And then uh, at the American Lung Association, we've also worked hard to address this issue in schools. And we have the Vape Free School schools initiative, which has two different programs. The first one, not on tobacco or not. And the second one is in depth. So not on tobacco is a teen smoking uh, cessation program. You may not know, but a lot of cessation programs are actually made for adults and then just used on teenagers. So this one was actually created with teenagers in mind. And it's evidence-based and has been really effective with 90% of teens who participate cutting back or quitting tobacco use altogether. And then in depth is great because it's an alternative to suspension and it helps students learn about nicotine dependence, healthy alternatives and how to kick the habit. So if a student gets caught vaping instead of punishing them, they're able to use this program, which just helps them learn about the dangers of vaping. Next slide. And finally, some other tobacco treatment resources that we have. Uh, first one with the American Lung Association, we have the Lung Helpline, and both of these are free to use. So the Lung Helpline has counselors and you can call for basically any lung health issue, whether it's COVID or quitting smoking or COPD. And there's someone that can be there to assist you in many different languages. And then the other, resource is the California Smokers Helpline. And this one's specifically for quitting smoking. And they've recently made it even more accessible for teenagers who might not be interested in calling a number, but they can actually just chat with someone. And this is great because they'll help you set up a one-on-one um, -on -one plan to quit smoking, and you'll be able to talk with a counselor one-on-one. -on -one. And that's all I have for you. Thank you. Well, that was great. Thank you so much. And I think uh, before we move to the next panelist, it's just an important reminder that there's been some major strides that have been made in this space, particularly in California, but there's still a lot more left to do. And I think it's important that whenever something big happens, you see the tobacco companies pivot and find another way or find another product. So I think uh, that's something that's very interesting about this space that you don't want to just celebrate and move on. That it definitely seems like there's more to be done. Um, I just want to put out a reminder that we have a very active chat today going on uh, in this presentation. So please submit your questions. We will get to those questions at the end. You can submit them in the chat. Um, very easy to access. And I will ask the panelists those questions at the end. All right, so let's move on to panelist number two, Dr. Cardo Cardohano. Uh, he's the assistant professor of the university at the University of Rochester Medical Center, um, and uh, he also uh, it's not just the public health sciences, but community health and prevention. Um, and he's the assistant director of the Office of Community Outreach and Engagement at Wilmot Cancer Institute, part of URMC. Now, Dr. Cardohano is currently managing a smoking cessation randomized clinical trial for Latinos in the U.S using principles of CBPR, uh, the cessation uh, 
and he enrolled 457 Latino smokers from different countries of birth and uh, alcultration levels. The study demonstrated that Latinos receiving a smoking cessation text messaging intervention are significantly more likely than those receiving standard care to be smoking abstinent at month six. So uh, this is someone that is on the front lines of the research in this space. Um, and I will just let Dr. Cardahano take it away and tell us more about what he's found. Thank you, Josh, for the introduction. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to have this presentation. <laughs> the work that I'm going to be showing and talking about today is conducted within a framework of having an active participation of community members. So we have convened a community advisory board, and this community advisory board has been working with us uh, for the past eight years. I always talk in plural because it's not only me, the one who's conducting all these studies. Um, I do believe in teamwork, so forgive me for speaking uh, in plural. Can we have the next slide, please? So for the past eight years, uh, my research has been focused primarily on uh, quitting regular cigarettes. And this is a study that we um, recently completed. This is a study in where we recruited 457 Latino smokers. Half of the participants received a standard of care, which consisted of educational materials and access to medications for quitting smoking, nicotine replacement therapies like the nicotine patch, gum, and lozenge. And the other half of participants also received educational materials, the access to the medications, but they receive a text messaging intervention for quitting smoking. This work is relevant because there are not many tobacco cessation interventions for Latinos. So this is one of the few studies over the past 20 years that have uh, purposely looked into Latinos. So can we have the next slide, please? Just to give you um, briefly an explanation of what the intervention looked like, this was an intervention in where we asked participants to identify their main reasons for quitting, their main um, uh, triggers, some strategies that they can do to cope with those triggers. We asked them to select a quit date and we introduced them to the medications for quitting smoking. Can I have the next slide? And then, like I mentioned before, then participants receive a text messaging intervention for the next six months. Uh, some of the cool features of our intervention is that we do the nicotine replacement therapy management over text messages, meaning we <clears throat> troubleshoot side effects. People can make refills by just answering text messages. We do have some algorithms to recognize whenever someone has relapsed. And if they have relapsed, we help them set up a new quit date. And something that we're also very proud of is the fact that um, we, we take very seriously uh, readability scores, meaning how easy our intervention is to understand. And this is particularly relevant whenever working uh, with populations um, that have low educational levels. So our intervention is rated in English at a fourth grade level, meaning someone who completed fourth grade is able to understand our messages. Can I have the next slide, please? Like I mentioned before, uh, <clears throat> the Community Advisory Board was the one who was guiding the recruitment of this particular study. And by engaging them into this process, we were able to recruit a very diverse sample of Latino smokers. We have over 20 Latin American uh, countries represented in the study. And through the Community Advisory Board, we were able to do lots of fun things in the community. For example, every time there was a parent night at a school, we will be there recruiting. We were even invited to Univision, which is the largest, one of the largest um, healthcare, uh, healthcare uh, media channels uh, for Latinos. And every time there was a health fair, we will be there uh, doing recruitment. Can I have the next slide? So what are the results of this study? So tan, tan, tan. we learn that participants who receive the text messaging intervention were more likely to quit smoking compared to those who only receive a standard of care. 34% uh, of participants quit smoking uh, receiving the text messaging intervention versus 20%. And this difference was statistically significant. Can I have the next slide? So we thought that was going to be it. We already discovered an intervention that was effective for helping Latinos quit smoking. However, 
this is the beautiful the beautiful story uh, about having community input in the research that we do. So the community has been nothing but supportive to all of the, our efforts for quitting regular cigarettes. However, they have always brought to our attention the fact that we need to start addressing vaping. Uh, there's one particular member of the community advisory board, and her name is Diana Bermudez. She works at a high school, and she would always report um, how uh, the use of electronic cigarettes was becoming more and more popular, and pretty much they didn't know what to do with it. So that's when we decided to then do more research on how to adapt our smoking cessation intervention for vaping cessation. Can I have the next slide? <clears throat> the first thing we did with the community advisory board was to understand how big of a problem we were facing. So everything started doing a survey and this survey was conducted back in 2019, so a couple of years ago. And it was surprising to learn that 19% of um, the adolescents who were in this particular high school were already using electronic cigarettes compared to 6% uh, for regular cigarettes. And even more alarming, 55% of adolescents were what we, cut, um, what we call susceptible to future vaping. And we didn't find any differences by race or ethnicity. Um, what does susceptible, susceptible to future vaping means? Um, this is a, <clears throat> a measure that we have been able to do over the uh, over the past years, uh, and we know that if we identify someone susceptible to future vaping, the chances of them using electronic cigarettes in the next two years are very high. Can I have the next slide? So we started to look what was available for helping people quit vaping. And we were very pleased to know that there is an intervention that uh, underwent a randomized control trial showing to be effective for helping um, <clears throat> young adults quit vaping. And this is an intervention provided by the Truth Campaign. Um, however, there are a couple of limitations that make us um, wonder if this is something we should be using broadly with the Latino population. One of them is that the study had a low representation of Latinos, only 10%. So the generalizable generalizability of these results are unknown. And the intervention was not available in Spanish. So can I have the next slide? <clears throat> so this is why we decided to apply for some funding to the American Lung Association. And we were uh, very happy to receive funding to develop an intervention for vaping cessation uh, for Latino young adults. And this is to adapt all of the knowledge that we know for quitting regular cigarettes to quitting vaping. So it's not only the development of the intervention, but also doing um, a pilot test of, of this intervention among Latino young adults. Can I have the next slide, please? So similar to what we know how, what we like to do and we know how to do, we convene a community advisory board. So these were Latino young adults. Uh, so uh, I want to publicly acknowledge each one of them. Can I have the next slide, please? And what we did with this community advisory board was to co-develop this intervention. So we had meetings with the advisory board to provide feedback in each one of the messages that we already have for quitting regular cigarettes. And the adaptation was not just as simple as replacing the word cigarette for e-cigarette. It was more to really make sure that the messages were relevant and made sense for vaping. And we are very proud because the final library consists of 280 messages. And something also very particular to this study is the fact that this is the very first effort, a systematic effort, to make sure that we are doing um, translations in an appropriate and culturally um, appropriate manner. So we were able to identify what was the best way to, to, to say a couple of concepts uh, in Spanish, like e-cigarette, vape, vaping. And this was by working with the Community Advisory Board. Can I have the next slide? We were able to learn a lot of things by working with uh, this Community Advisory Board, um, like having bi-directional communication with the members and the study team, 
um, we, it was also very impressive to understand why they were wanting to be part of this study, but it also took us some time to explain the study and the relevance of it. We used democratic approaches, we created a safe space, we were compassionate, and something that we're always looking for is to acknowledge the members' effort and contribution to the project by including them in all um, um, poster presentations, manuscripts, you name it. Can I have the next slide? So this is where we are. We, we have already developed an intervention, so now we're ready to start a pilot study. We are looking to recruit for 50 Latino young adults, and this is a study that is going to be available nationwide. Some of the eligibility criteria is that participants need to be in between the ages of 18 and 25 years old. They need to currently use electronic cigarettes. Everything is fully remote. And particip all participants are going to be receiving the text messaging intervention for quitting vaping. Can I have the next slide? <clears throat> and finally, I want to acknowledge uh, all of my mentors and the study team that work with me. Uh, I'm looking forward for the questions that you may have and happy to answer them after the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. And just a reminder that you can submit <laughs> questions in the chat. Uh, and you can write them anytime throughout uh, this panel. We actually only have one panelist left, so now is a good time to write some of your questions. Let's move on to that final panelist, uh, April Forrest. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, April Forrest is a master's in public health graduate and a DRPH candidate at Claremont Graduate University. April has a BA from Pitzer in global public health community engagement, emphasizing women's health disparities. She's interned and volunteered in LA County, Riverside County, and in several countries around the world. As she continues to study, April hopes to continue broadening her lens on public health and its intersectionality. April's work in public health in recent years includes the American Lung Association, where she was a health educator during her time at the American Lung Association. She worked in the cities of La Mirada and Norwalk, educating kids and adults on the dangers of vaping and the importance of lung health, creating coalitions and passing local policies. April, take it away. Hi there. Thank you, Josh, for the awesome introduction. And thank you, American Lung, for having me. Um, so uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit about coalition work um, to start. Uh, that was some of the stuff that I got to do while I was at American Lung. Uh, so I guess I wanted to start first, like what is a coalition? Um, so it's basically just a, an alliance of co for combined action, um, especially um, a temporary alliance um, for political parties forming um, government or states, or it can be on a topic. Um, specifically, I guess in this case, we're talking about um, lung health. So some of the work that I did with American Lung Association is um, help create coalitions um, for mostly parents uh, of teens that were using uh, vaping products. Um, so why are why are coalitions important? Um, I think we kind of touched on that a bit. Coalitions um, are relevant resources around a specific goal. Um, for example, again, we're talking about tobacco and vaping today. Um, coalitions offer the opportunity to coordinate services, involve the community, um, and limit duplications of parallel um, competing efforts. Um, so also, too, I, I mean, it, I don't have it here on the slide, but education, education, education. Um, being a part of a, a coalition or even starting one, uh, a big part of that is being able to educate the community. Uh, so and, and who can be a part of a, a coalition? Um, anyone can be a part of a coalition. Um, it's definitely about having that same passion. Um, a coalition can be formed by just two people um, that are working towards a common goal. Um, however, we are stronger in numbers, so the bigger the better. Uh, coalitions are open to all members of the community that share a common interest. Um, it does not matter your culture, your socioeconomic status, um, or your educational background. I think everybody um, in any community brings something different uh, to a coalition. So, for example, uh, as, a, as a parent of a, a student or a teen that's vaping, um, you can bring that insight of, you know, how it's affecting your child. So, um, I think coalitions are, are super important for that reason. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so how can we make a successful coalition? So to create a successful coalition, you must create relationships um, in all groups. And so, uh, so create one-on-one -on -one relationships and community partnerships, um, create a group to, uh, of active supporters um, and communicate positions on difficult controversial issues. 
Um, so the picture that I have here um, to, to my right um, is actually a coalition meeting that I had while I was at American Lung. So this is uh, community members that are wanting to know more about vaping. So uh, I believe that the parents that are um, in this coalition, their, their kids had, had been caught vaping. And so they you know, wanted to get more educated on what it actually meant for their bodies. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a great group. Um, so where can a coalition take place? So your coalition can take place anywhere. Um, some meeting spaces can be um, community centers. So these, I just listed some that where we had ours. Um, community centers, you can have them at parks, um, recreation centers, coffee shops. Uh, coalition members can host them at their home, uh, schools. Um, and then during the pandemic, or even still, Zoom has been um, a great resource as far as having uh, you know, coalition meetings. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so another thing I wanted to touch on today was um, the LGBT. Uh, LGBTQA plus community. Uh, so there are definitely some inequities in tobacco use in LGBTQA plus teens um, in commercial tobacco use. So this is some data that I found that I found really interesting uh, that was on the National LGBT um, Cancer Network. So um, LGBTQ plus people are three times more likely to be exposed to tobacco coupon messages on video streaming websites such as Hulu. Um, those with minority identities that experience a combination of um, homophobia, transphobia, racism, um, and other forms of discrimination are more likely to have higher rates of tobacco use. Uh, one in four LGBTQA plus are uh, becoming addicted to nicotine through vaping. Um, and 97% uh, of youth who vape are vaping with flavors, um, including menthol. So we'll talk a little bit more about the ban in California in just a bit. Um, and there is heavy, uh, heavy marketing geared toward um, the LGBTQ plus communities. Um, and so here on the, on the right for me um, are just some examples of some of the um, advertising that you can see um, when you're out in the community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then I just, I, I pulled up some more. So um, again, there's a, an experience burden in this uh, community. So I, I pulled up some more data um, that came from the CDC. Um, so in 2011, almost 18% of LGB uh, high school students used some tobacco product. Uh, this is compared to the 11.4% of heterosexual uh, identifying high school students. Uh, middle school students' uh, tobacco products use is three times higher for LGBT students than um, heterosexual uh, students. One in five LGB uh, middle school students and high school students uh, current use uh, vapes in 2020 compared to the one in eight uh, heterosexual students. And tobacco is the leading cause of lung cancer um, in, all, um, in, all in all of America. And uh, it links to about 11 different cancer types um, that can come from tobacco. So an estimated 45,000 LGBTQ plus people will die from cancer this year. So I thought that was really important to look at, um, you know, the way that tobacco can um, not only just it, it, with lung cancer being the biggest, but that there are 11 other types of cancers that can be linked to smoking. Um, next slide, please. Um, so something that great that happened this year. Um, so a tobacco policy in California, Propos uh, Proposition 31 passes. So um, policy in tobacco, or uh, policy in public health. So public health policy um, puts research and theory um, into practice um, through law. Um, and so it gives public health professionals and it gives coalitions um, the opportunity to put this into real life practice without it. Um, so tobacco policy here in California, Proposition 31 passes. Um, so what is Proposition 31? Uh, it was a law uh, that was passed in 2022 in order to implement um, SB 793 after the uh, referendum by the tobacco industry. So this gave voters uh, the final say after the referendum. Um, In-person and vending machines could not sell flavored tobacco products um, or tobacco products that are flavor enhanced. Um, and that includes menthol cigarettes. And I know uh, Kimberly touched on that earlier, how the, at a point that was left out. So this takes care of that this time around. Um, so basically what happens is there's a fee for those violators. Um, it's a $250 penalty 
uh, per violation for the store and the vending machine owners. Next slide, please. Okay, and this was just a quote that I found really important. If you're here at this meeting today, I'm assuming that you um, also feel very passionate about, um, you know, lung health. And um, so this is a uh, quote from June Jordan, and it says, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Next slide. Okay, well, thank you so much. Those are my slides. Thanks for that. So uh, now is another good reminder, a good time to submit your questions. We're going to actually move on to some questions. Um, really, just want to thank our panelists, as you, as everyone just heard, a really uh, impressive group of panelists with incredibly diverse backgrounds um, that I think will not just answer our questions but also be able to move the conversation forward. I'm going to start off with a question before we get to your questions. Um, and I wanted to uh, sort of say, kind of going off of what I said earlier, we know that there's been some major strides taken in California and LA County, but nationally, where do things stand as far as national bans? Um, you know, what what can be done? Because we know that if it exists in one state, it'll get to another state. And uh, what is being done to really tackle this problem? on a national scale, so it's not just California leading the way. You want to take it, April? Or anyone, go ahead, Kimberly or Frank, or uh, French, Dr. Cartagena. Um, well, I can just mention the that the FDA proposed to ban menthol. Um, however, I just think that that is going to take a little while. So I think the best thing to do is just really local work and for local jurisdictions to um, kind of do what's right for their communities and use some of the best practices that we know about. Because I think it it is going to be a fight because the tobacco industry has a lot of money and has a lot of resources. So um, just anything that local jurisdictions can do, I think, is the best. All right, and a question for Dr. Cartagena. Uh, is your program nationwide or is it just in New York? Obviously, there's a very large uh, Latino population in, in Southern California. Would it be fair to draw your findings and, and say that, that those would be representative of the community in Southern California? Um, so the study that we are about to start, uh, the one for vaping cessation, yes, that's going to be available nationwide. Um, everything is fully remote, which I think makes everything super convenient. And it's just as simple as people who are interested in participating in this study just contacting us. Um, so yeah, and hopefully we're going to be able to have a very diverse uh, sample of participants. Um, and hopefully some uh, of that diversity is also going to come from the state in where they live. So hopefully we're going to have people all over the U.S. Excellent. Following up on that, what are popcorn lungs and is that the same as lung cancer? Is vaping the cause of that condition? Is that a question for me? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, ju just to clarify, there has no, we haven't, we as scientists, as a scientific community, we have not been able to link the use of electronic cigarettes with cancer. Um, however, we have been able to make some links of the use of electronic cigarettes with lung diseases and heart diseases. Um, why we haven't been able to make this connection with cancer, just because cancer is a disease that takes very long time to develop. And sadly, we're not going to be able to know that for sure for the next 25, 30 years um, when those who are currently using electronic cigarettes develop or not cancer. So yet to be known. However, we have been doing some studies by uh, looking at the e-liquids that are in the electronic cigarettes, and we have found some carcinogens. So... I mean, I, I think that gives us an idea on where the story might go. So, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. Um, April, since you're back, just a quick question. 
if I wanted to create a coalition in my community, what are the initial steps and why do you feel uh, so how do you create a coalition and why do you feel they're so effective? Yeah, uh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, so I, I definitely think uh, it starts with your passion first. So uh, first and foremost, having a passion for something um, that you want to change. Um, I think next would come um, just being able to educate yourself. So um, finding as many resources as you can. So, you know, in this case, we're talking about like lung health. So you can constantly find great resources um, just on lung.org. Um, and, you know, coming to, to panels like this where, you know, we'll also have some, I think there will be some educational resources um, in the chat. Um, and then again, it's just kind of finding a group of people that have that same common interest as you um, and, and working as a team, um, finding your special skills, um, working as a team and, you know, just kind of putting together, you know, a case for why this is important. And that's kind of where you take that next step, which is, um, you know, after I think education and policy come hand in hand. So once you've educated yourself, um, you know, just making small changes in your community um, is kind of where you start. And I think once people see that, you know, you are uh, making a change in your community, other communities want to see that happen. And, um, you know, and, and then it just kind of snowballs. So that would be my advice on starting a coalition. And, you know, the reason they're so important is they can protect, um, you know, your community and things that are specifically happening in your community. Kimberly, question for you. Is banning flavors really helpful to supporting our youth with anti-vaping? Can you just talk about sort of the connection between banning flavors? Will that actually help us with this fight against vaping? Sure, yeah, I, I mean, I think we obviously, um, that will be determined uh, in the next couple of years, but the reason that flavors were what was targeted is because it is a best practice. It is what worked with um, cigarettes. And before vaping came on the scene, uh, smoking rates among teenagers were at historic lows, especially in California. And we know that, uh, teens have been asked if they um, got rid of flavors, would they continue smoking? And they said no. And I've also heard of teenagers who, you know, they didn't like one flavor, so they just tried another flavor. And so, um, you know, it, we won't know until we actually ban flavors. But yeah, I think that there's a pretty good chance of it reducing the smoking rate significantly. And I'm just going to add something to that, Kimberly, if I may have. Um, so one thing is developing these policies. The other thing is implementing them. As we all know, there's a temporary ban uh, when it comes to electronic cigarettes and flavors. Uh, the data of New York um, is not look in, in terms of the actual implementation of that policy is not looking very strong, meaning we still find a lot of places in where adolescents and young adults can buy flavor electronic cigarettes. So I, I and, and I believe that that's something that we as community members, we can all be part of it. And I really appreciate it, April's point. Um, we, we, we should all be active in making sure that these policies are being implemented correctly. So, yeah. Yeah, can I just piggyback off of that as well? Uh, no, I, I think that's a great point. And um, I, again, kind of going back to that question of like why um, coalitions are so important. So when we have something, especially in a, in a state as big as California, um, you know, implement a policy, um, not necessarily are they always going to be implemented. So when you take those um, steps to bring it out into your community, you're more likely to, um, you know, have the police that are there to back you up. And so, you know, we worked with law enforcement um, and so that, you know, just making people aware um, and you know, getting people involved. And then there, there was definitely always this competition. So it's like, if your city was doing really great, you know, the city next to you also wanted to do that. So um, yeah, just reiterating everything that they kind of said and kind of bringing it back. Awesome. Um, any tips, and this is a question for all three of our panelists, any tips for parents on how to talk with your kids about vaping? We know that it is, I mean, I mean that that's that's a hard question for any topic. Um, but how can you break through the kids to let them know that this isn't a joke? 
I'm happy to <laughs> answer that. Um, I 100% agree with you. I think parents need to be, and caregivers need to be involved um, and have these conversations with the adolescents. Um, every time I, because I also do research on vaping prevention, not only in cessation. And every time I go uh, out to community settings to talk about the studies that we're implementing, it blows my mind how there's this disconnect between what adolescents are doing and what they know with what the parents and caregivers know. Meaning some parents have no idea what the new electronic devices, electronic cigarette devices look like. Um, I think we can all detect the smell of regular cigarettes, but like I believe it was Kimberly who mentioned some of the electronic cigarettes nowadays, they 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 smell quite cool. I, I, I even like some of those smells. Um <clears throat> And some of them are very discreet, very colorful. So for some parents, they would never think that those are electronic cigarettes. So one thing that I always like to do when presenting these studies is to have educational sessions with the parents and caregivers, because I think one of the very first steps is for them to, to really understand what's happening and for them to be informed and have the knowledge. Um, and I think that's kind of like one of the first steps to start these conversations. Now, the other thing that I always like to stress is we lead by example. So if parents are currently using any tobacco product, um, I think it's making sure that their adolescents are not going to use electronic cigarettes might be and is a good motivator for them to quit tobacco. So um, hopefully that, that, that can help them um, break the cycle in the family, if that makes sense. <clears throat> Can I just add to that? Um, so I, I'm I'm a mother. I have a 13 year old daughter, um, and so uh, she she and I both were an advantage because you know I, I worked for American Lung um, when she was just nine and ten. So we started having those conversations really early because you know we would do presentations with with elementary school kids and and middle school and high school and you know by the time they get to high school there's already that possibility that they're doing. And I mean, even as, as, as soon as middle school. Um, so, you know, it, when, they're, when they're young, um, they're a lot more impressionable. So it's a lot easier to have these conversations with them. Um, and so I, I think it's better to have these conversations with your kids um, and not necessarily, you know, I, I don't love the idea of like the scare tactic, but just giving them real information um, before they actually start so that they have that, that information is coming from you as a parent and it, it's facts rather than what their friends think. Um, and I found that really helpful for my daughter. And um, I know that she tends to be a little, you know, um, peer educator at this point. So she's constantly telling her friends about like why vaping is bad. And, and I'm really proud of that. I'm really proud of the work that I do at American Lung or that I did at American Lung for that reason. Um, you know, just seeing her kind of continue on with it. So. There's also been some pretty alarming stories of kids really like injuring themselves and, and worse uh, that have gotten a lot of news coverage nationwide. I wonder how can the media do a better job to cover these stories to, because I think the best way for someone to be concerned about something is when they hear it happen to their peer. So what, do you think that vaping gets enough coverage in the news? What's being done to get more coverage and uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think we've definitely done a good job of dispelling a lot of the myths. I think for a long time, people did think that vaping was sort of a healthy alternative. Um, so I think it's, it's changed a little, but I think there was definitely more coverage before the pandemic. The pandemic kind of took the um, spotlight away, I guess, because a lot of those injuries to the lungs happened right before the pandemic. So I think now that kids are back in school, we're a little concerned that the vaping rates are going to go back up. So I think now is the time to be really vigilant and make sure that people continue to remember that this is one really popular 
And also, um, I think it's important to think about the mental health aspect of it. A lot of teachers have told us that the students are really stressed out, and so they might be self-medicating. So I think April mentioned not doing it from like a scare tactic, scare tactic point of view, but really looking at the big picture and thinking about why they're vaping. And um, yeah, just continuing to keep the pressure on now that they're back in school and rates might go back up. I'd also say that Dr. Cartagena's study, although it's looking at one particular group, it affects everyone. So you can you can um, think that if you look at it too narrowly, you may think that it may not impact you, but actually it's looking at a problem, zeroing in on a trait. And uh, I think that that's, that's interesting. I mean, same thing with what April mentioned about the LGBTQ people. All right, any other questions or um, Kimberly, is there anything you want to close? Maybe I'll give you guys each a minute or two for sort of a closing statement. Kimberly, you can go first. Sure, I'd just like to reiterate the resources that we have, um, both in depth and not are great for schools or community groups. Um, again, with that, alternative to suspension and focusing on education rather than just punishing students who may have been caught vaping. Um, and of course, the lung helplines that we have are really great resources for anyone that needs any type of lung health uh, related help. Um, and just uh, to remember to be kind of not judgmental because smoking is really addictive. So we just want to help people who need the help. I just want to say thank you again for the invitation. And if anyone is interested in learning more about these studies, or you know someone who may want to participate, or if you yourself are interested in participating, please contact me. Uh, and I'm more than happy to share more information about study participation. Uh, just one more thing, I, I don't think I mentioned it. The study is available, given that this is for Latinos, the study is available in English and Spanish. So hopefully that's also gonna break some barriers. Awesome, yeah, thank you uh, for having me today. And, um, you know, I, I only focused a bit on, um, just a small portion on LGBTQA community, uh, but, um, you know, basically any minority group um, is targeted by tobacco companies. Um, so I, I, did, I didn't want, I wanted to make sure to mention that. Um, and there, you know, there's always a ton of stuff that you can read. Um, I think it's super important to educate yourself. Um, the tobacco companies are incredibly smart and tricky. Um, you know, like we said, tobacco rates and smoking were down and then here comes <coughs> the um, So, yeah, I mean, it, and I think my information is going up too. So if you ever have any questions and you want to talk more about like coalition building, um, that's a passion of mine. And I would I would be more than happy to talk about that. Um, or, you know, also being a, a parent to a teen and, you know, having those those conversations, I'd you know, be happy to discuss that more. Yeah, before everyone logs off, I'd highly recommend that you scroll through the chat and look at some of the resources that have been posted there. In addition to uh, the contact information for our panelists, I just want to thank our panelists, everybody watching, uh, this is not the end of this conversation. Um, and I'm sure that uh, more developments will come in the youth vaping space. So thank you for your time. Um, and uh, hopefully it was informative. And thank you for anyone out there who follows our work at ABC7 Eyewitness News. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And you can learn more about me and follow me at ABC7 Josh Haskell. That's one word. ABC7 Josh Haskell, J O S H H A S K E L L. Uh, and I am on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you guys so much. You can also, I'm sure, follow the American Lung Association on social media as well for their updates. Um, and thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. At California Lung was just posted. <laughs>